Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and what follows is an excerpted clip from one of my longer webinars. So what I've decided is that sometimes when people ask really interesting questions, I will pull out that particular part of a webinar and make it available to you as a short clip so that if you don't have time to watch a one-hour webinar, you can at least watch and listen to the brief exchanges that I usually have with people who attend my webinars. So here is one such clip from a recent webinar. I hope you enjoy it. Is there a need for such kind of work in Pakistan? Absolutely. And who will do that? I mean, it's like rephrasing John Crow Ransom, the task of liberating Pakistani historiography from these mythologies is the task of the scholars, right? Task of professors, you students of literature and history is to figure out how to tell the stories differently. And then if there is a pushback from the state institutions or you know, whatever powers that be, right? The more people write about these things and talk about these things, the less is the coercive power of any institution to control thought. In my personal humble opinion, Pakistan will not grow as a complex, diverse, animated culture unless its intellectuals are free to talk, unless its intellectuals don't just follow the party line, but write on the edge of thought, right? And write about things that matter and that may affect people's life, unless they have the courage to do that and an env environment in which they can do that. There is no way any nation on this planet can, can sustain itself through totally controlled narratives. You would then need a system like China where there's supposed to be a communist party which is deeply capitalistic and somehow they can keep the people under control. I don't think so despite all the problems in Pakistan our people will be ready for a system like China. Right? What are the reasons or advantages of not telling original history to Pakistani people? So I have two questions. What do you mean by original history, right? Uh, because I mean history, there is no history outside of texts, right? History is textual. It's recorded in text. Someone records it. So history is motivated at both ends. Someone writes it. You have to take into account their politics, their lived conditions, what made them write a history. And then someone retrieves it and teaches it. So the politics, prejudices, and preferences of the person who retrieves it are part of it, right? Now, what can we do since it is all textual, is to incorporate more texts within any history mainstream that is being told. What are the advantages is, if we know more about the past and how it is constructed, it can enable us to understand the present better. And maybe it enables us to forge a better future. So think of it this way, if, if Pakistani high school students come up with this idea of a history in which they Muslims were always superior and Hindus were always inferior. And for 1,000 years, they lived as these two separate communities with no coincidences and no correspondences. All they think of Hindus is an, an essentialized view of them. So what would they think of Hindus who live in their own country then? Their views will be informed by that. Now, if we could have a richer history which tells us no, I mean, yeah, there were wars between, you know, dominant Hindu groups and Muslim groups. But by and large, you know, in most Indian polities and states and nations, yeah, they were able to coexist together. The objective differences were there, but they were subjectivized by politics, right? So then we create a tolerant group of people, a group of people who can take difference and live with it and respect each other. Uh, let's not even go uh, to even Hindu-Muslim differences, the sectarian differences in Pakistan, right? We can either teach the history of Islam as a history of Islam that started as one interpretation and then bifurcated into different, and that it doesn't matter who you are as in the end of, by the, at the end of the day, if you follow 
the path of kindness and the path of the prophet you're good enough as a muslim then we can create a tolerant subjectivity but if same people only hear the history of sunni islam and within that of mr abdul wahab right and ahmed ibn hanbal then you're creating a human subjectivity that absolutely will see anyone else even if they are sunnis as wajibul qatl as this and that so that's the difference in being exposed to more complex knowledge and being exposed to just literalist one interpretation of any history how can next generation confirm the veracity of textual substance written by different author good point okay so like how do you do that i mean this is what we teach our students okay the habit of critical reading and what is that any time you enter a text and you start reading it ask yourself where is this person coming from you know when I, what i teach in my literary theory class to my students is not just what theories are but to immediately know first of all is this person a marxist is this person a feminist because knowing that tells you which frame of reference that person is using so part of it is critically looking at a text and asking yourself where is this person coming from if you do a little bit of research about the author especially if it's a journalist read their previous work you can already tell their biases right so what that teaches you then is what account of that history is mediated through the ideology that that person is in right that's the first step where is the author coming from right then you can go and look up other sources on the same topic see evaluate those sources it can't be just a blog by a 12 year old somewhere in the world i mean it has to be like something that is credible right and then you have another resource you also have to find out what their prejudices and preferences are so overall even a comparison would not just be comparison of content but also comparison of who has written it what are their own politics and preferences all of this will bear upon you understanding a historical fact differently right as i just pointed out right about uh, the salahuddin ayub or angzeb i keep saying salahuddin mahmud of ghazna's 17 hamle india ke upar in all muslim <laughs> pakistani history textbooks those are valorized right then we are supposed to love mahmud of ghazna right A and uh, we have never ever thought of those 17 invasions from the point of view of the people who were being invaded did they deserve to be invaded why was mahmud of ghazni coming to india because india was a rich part of the world there was a lot of loot and plunder there right i remember the first time when i word read the word loot and plunder in that context was in an english history book i was shocked right because to me like oh my god mahmud of ghazna was this muslim hero right but that jarring shock made me think about his acts and then i realized history is what the victors tell us but a better history is to also look at it from the point of view of the vanquished what happened to the people and then when i connected it to the history of my own ethnic group and i realized my people were the one being attacked right they were the ones who were fighting uh, against this and what what did it give me then a better understanding of history a more compassionate view of what otherwise would have been my others right people whom i would have vilified and not liked even without knowing a single one of them and that is i think the tragedy of pakistani historiography i have talked to people from bangladesh one of them actually is my student right now my first phd candidate was from ahmedabad right she wrote a wonderful dissertation what i've learned through these experiences especially in the context of india and pakistan is that we have so many shared cultural metaphors cultural experience the way we tell our jokes and this even goes to south of india not just northern india the way we talk to each other they go up when when an indian student writes to me an email right if i could share it with you it's exactly the way pakistani students they always call me sir 
right? On Facebook, they always call me, sir. It's because we both come from the same colonial heritage where we were taught to do that, right? So many other things, the jokes that we tell, the songs that we dance to, the songs that make us cry, right, are the same. So if we have to build differences built in distrust and hate, those are built on very flimsy grounds. If we really try to build bridges and to get to know each other better and to love each other, we have more substantial historical and cultural foundation for that, right? So as a scolar, I mean, you all know, I mean, there is, I don't have any power or anything, but as a scholar, where do I stand on? I would, I stand on the first stance of Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Right? What was he looking for? Not for a separate country. What he was looking for was a confederacy. Right? Muslim majority areas formed their own government. Hindu majority areas formed their own government. And Muslims, the fear of minoritization, have parity in the in the Lok Sabha. Right? That was his basic claim. So if we are really daring together and thinking the future, I would say 10 years down the road, despite Mr. Modi and all the other nationalists on our side, let's sit together as people and say, can we build a coalition in which three or four nations come together and have this large identity as a confederacy? Think of the power of that in the world. Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka coming together and saying, hey, you know, let's sit together and build this dream world. Right? Look at the power of that. Right? Now, as, a, as an intellectual, is it a taboo subject? Probably. But if I am going to think critically as a scholar, why would I think that is possible? Right? Why not think the impossible and work towards that? How the world has changed because people thought the impossible. Right? Civil rights movements here. Right, we are Amb uh, Ambedkar in India. Right, thinking of the Dalit rights. I mean, he's the one who wrote the Indian Constitution. Right, um, people in Pakistan, Adi Saab. Right, if you look at the life of Mr. Adi, he started with fifty pesos, and by the time he passed away, he had created an organization which has taken care of millions of people. These are the people who thought the impossible and made it happen. So, if we are going to dare to think, then there would be no subalterns, right? Because they'll be included in our hearts and in our national, regional narratives, right? And no one would be told you are less than me and less than those and less than the other, because ultimately we are all human. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this brief clip. If you are interested in the longer version, the link will be in the description and you can watch the whole webinar. Thank you so much for your support. And as always, if you have any questions, any concerns, you can always post them in the comments and I'll be happy to respond to them. If you have a moment and if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do so now so that you get timely notifications of whatever is happening on this channel. Thank you for your support. Stay safe and as always, from me, to you, peace and love.